of I knew of Jude Doyle as Sadie Doyle for over a decade. Forever, right? forever. Right? Their, 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 their argument was, I'm a woman, I'm a feminist, my cause right. is Hillary Clinton and, 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 you know, like liberal white feminism. And as a woman, I've, I under, I, I've suffered misogyny and sexism, and that's why this is my cause. That's what all you heard. And now it's suddenly on a dime. It's, no, I'm actually LGBT. And not only am I LGBT, but I'm the one who gets to take this LGBT flag that you've been living under for your whole life and beat you with it. The death of God is about the drying up of a horizon of meaning and of a whole form of human life. Where do we stand in the illusion it makes? What kind of space are we invited into? The material relations between people become social relations between things. When we look at toasters, corn, and TVs, we don't we see... We still, them. to a large extent, live in the interregnum between, between worlds, if you will, or between paradigms. Not many people in the history of the world have faced that. Zero Squared is the Zero Books podcast. Glenn Greenwald is most well known for helping Edward Snowden publish classified material exposing the massive reach of the U.S. surveillance apparatus into the lives of U.S. citizens. He is a Pulitzer Prize winner and has written for Salon, The Guardian, The Intercept, and many other publications. His book, Securing Democracy, is coming out in a few days from a, a competitor named Haymarket. Uh, Glenn Greenwald has also been canceled on Twitter many times for his thought crimes. Glenn, welcome to the Zero Books channel. It's great to be with you. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate the invitation. Yeah. So um, your book is about the Bolsonaro government in Brazil, and it's about the work you did to expose the corruption within it. Um, you're an example of a journalist whose work can really shape political reality. Here's the twist uh, question. Given how powerful words can be, how can you explain why you're so committed to free speech? Can we really just trust anyone to say whatever they want? For me, the power of words is precisely why free speech is so urgent, because what I begin with is the premise that all humans and therefore all human institutions are fallible. And that if you look at the evolution of intellectual history, that typically the orthodoxies of one generation become the shame and disgraces of the next, precisely because they come to be recognized as error. So if you vest the power in any one faction or any one group of people or any one institution to determine what ideas can and can't be said, the power that they then wield is so immense, virtually unchallengeable, precisely because of what you said accurately, that words are so powerful to shape society, that it's essentially asking for tyranny. And I think the only way to balance and check that power is by ensuring that everyone has the right to question, challenge, dissent, argue, and make their own arguments about why various pieties and orthodoxies are are wrong. When when you uh, recently have been writing about the Bolsonaro government, it's actually had dr dramatic real world political effects. Do you want to uh, explain for people who may not be up to date, uh, or to remind me of just exactly what what you've done? <laughs> Yeah, sure. So, you know, you mentioned the, the Snowden story, which a lot of people in the United States obviously are aware of. And I remember in 2015, uh, I traveled to Sweden to do an event with Carl Bernstein. And it was kind of billed as, you know, the reporter of the prior generation who did the most important story, which was Watergate, and the reporter of this generation who did the most important story, which is the NSA work I did with Snowden. And I met with him and we had dinner the night before and he said to me, you know, look, um, I'm sure you know this, but this is like a once in a lifetime story. This isn't going to happen again. So make sure to enjoy it while it lasts. And I remember thinking, wow, that's kind of harsh, but probably true. And then in 2019, on Mother's Day, I was contacted by a politician in Brazil, Manuela Davila, who was a longtime member of Congress, and she was the candidate who ran on the workers party ticket against Bolsonaro. She was the vice presidential candidate in 2018, which lost to Bolsonaro. 
And she called me and said she had been contacted by a hacker, and the hacker said that he had obtained enormous amounts of material, a gigantic archive showing huge corruption on the part of top Brazilian officials, including the Minister of Justice for Bolsonaro's government, who at the time prior, who prior to joining Bolsonaro's government, was the judge presiding over the anti-corruption probe that had imprisoned Lula and so many other left-wing politicians and members of Congress and was actually the driving force behind the impeachment of President Dilma Rousseff of the Workers' Party as well, the person who succeeded Lula in the presidency. And so she put me in touch with this source who then did provide me this enormous archive of documents, bigger actually than the Snowden archive, which up until that point had been the biggest leak in journalism. And it enabled us to spend the next year revealing systematically that this justice minister of Bolsonaro's had used systematic corruption when presiding over this anti-corruption probe, including in the conviction of Lula. Lula was in prison at the time on, on these charges that he was found guilty for. And it, it had a lot of effects, obviously. It destabilized the Bolsonaro government because that justice minister was the key person in that government. It ended up exonerating Lula. Three months after we started, the Supreme Court ordered Lula freed on a technicality, but because of that political climate. And then just this month, the Supreme Court ruled that his convictions had to be nullified on the grounds of misconduct by the judge, which is what our reporting had revealed. But it also obviously resulted in a lot of attacks on me and my husband, who's a member of Congress uh, in Brazil. He's a member of the Socialist Party that Bolsonaro most hates. And it culminated in my criminal indictment uh, on conspiracy charges for having criminally conspired with my source. Those charges have some, since been thrown out. So this book kind of tells the story of Brazil, but it also tells the story of my life with my husband in Brazil and the reporting that we did and the backlash and the consequences that it engendered. So um, how much speech protection do, do you have in Brazil in comparison to, say, in the United States? Um, is there more power with the state to stamp out speech that uh, they don't like? Uh, are you at more risk there than you would be here for publishing that kind of material? Well, yeah, I mean, it's interesting uh, because I, that was obviously the question I had, right? When I was first contacted by uh, this congresswoman and then by my source was, you know, I was very familiar with the press freedom laws in the U.S. and in Europe, in the U.K., where I had done the Snowden reporting. I wasn't nearly as familiar as I was uh, in Brazil and what I learned was that I knew that Brazil has, in terms of free speech, similar laws to Western Europe and less protections for free speech than the U.S. So, for example, hate speech can be prosecuted and often is. It is arguably against the law to defend the military dictatorship that ruled Brazil from 1964 until 1985. That was supported by the U.S. and engineered by the U.S. So there's more free speech restrictions in Brazil than there is in the U.S. It's much more similar to Western Europe in that regard. But the press freedom protections under the Brazilian Constitution that were enacted in 1989 when Brazil re-democratized re are more robust than they are in the U.S. So, for example, the Brazilian Constitution guarantees the right of the journalists to protect the anonymity of their source. You, you can't be compelled by the government to disclose who gave you information or who your source is, whereas in the U.S., people have been fighting for decades for a press shield law on the federal level, and there is none. There's none in the Constitution, and there's very robust press freedom protections. The problem was not so much what protections are guaranteed on paper, but when we began the reporting in May of 2019, June of 2019, Bolsonaro had just been elected five months earlier. He was elected in the end of 2018, was inaugurated at the beginning of 2019, so they were at the peak of their power. It was kind of like the honeymoon, not just the Bolsonaro, but this, you know, extremist right wing movement that was swept into power with them. And so we didn't know what protections these institutions like the judiciary, the Congress, the media were going to be able to enforce. We didn't know if these rights were going to be honored. That was the big question looming over Brazil is to what extent will Bolsonaro permit democratic values to continue to thrive and this was really the first test case of that question for the Bolsonaro presidency. And probably the fact that you are internationally known helped 
to protect you and to in that situation do you think that there were oh yeah i mean yeah for sure you know i mean when i was indicted for example um you know every major media outlet in the west the new york times the guardian uh the washington post right-wing outlets like fox news denounced bolsonaro every press freedom group in the world did um at the time we were in the middle of the democratic primary bernie sanders elizabeth warren tulsi gabbard all defended me that helps a lot you know and i've often said i I, this there was this thing that struck with me stuck with me i was once on a journalism panel like five years ago in brazil and it was it was like called courage in journalism or whatever and it was you know me i was there to talk about the snowden story and with me on the panel was this guy who i'd never heard of he was with this tiny paper in the interior of brazil you know, like a kind of rural town. Mm-hmm. And he discovered this corruption on the part of his local police force. You know, they were like getting grants to build new police stations and saying they built them and he would go there and it would be like a small little shack. And obviously they had pilfered the money given by the town and he started reporting on it and he was getting viciously threatened, rocks thrown through his window, Molotov cocktails, bump threats left on his door, his mu- his wife and kids had to leave. And I realized at the time, like in general, when journalists are really endangered, if you're well known or famous or have an international platform, it's an incredible protection. Most times journalists who are murdered or persecuted are ones like him who work in relative obscurity. That's real bravery that it takes. Now that's not to say that being well known is a permanent shield. You can ask Jamal Khashoggi about that. He was chopped up in the Turkish embassy by the Saudis, despite being a Washington Post columnist. As I said, they did try to prosecute me, but it certainly is a major, major weapon that you have as right. a journalist if you're known. Yeah. So if people only knew you for the Snowden journalism that you've done and the and the work that you've just done in Brazil or even in, for your uh, work in the um, early 2000s and during the Bush administration, they might be surprised to discover that you have become kind of hated by the left today. And I'm just, uh, you know, I know why to, to a degree, but I'm, uh, I, I wonder if you're surprised to the degree to which you've been sort of ostracized by at least the online left. Uh, or been attacked by the online left? Yeah, I mean, yes and no. You know, um, when, you know, when I uh, first started writing about politics, it was 2005, and I mostly created a blog for the purpose of uh, kind of sounding the alarm about civil liberties attacks by the Bush Cheney administration in the name of the war on terror, and I was using my expertise as a constitutional lawyer to do it in a way that I didn't think was getting enough attention. So I developed this major fan base composed largely of partisan Democrats. I mean, just like standard normie liberals, um, Mm -hmm. because I was known for attacking the Bush Cheney administration, arguing that they were committing crimes. And then when President Obama in 2008 won and was inaugurated in 2009, and there was kind of this split among Democrats, some of the Democrats turned on a dime and started defending Obama's war on terror, which was very aggressive and very similar to the Bush Cheney one. And some of us continued to criticize him. And when, because I was in that latter group, focusing a lot of criticism on the Obama administration, not just for the war on terror, but also closeness to corporate lobbyists and the like, a lot of people who were previously my allies and supporters and even readers and fans became my adversaries and my enemies. So I know that as time goes by, political debates shift and your allies of today may be your enemies of tomorrow and vice versa. So in in one way, I'm not surprised. And in, in, in another way, I'm not surprised because I know I have a polarizing personality. I tend to be aggressive in political debates and, and, and sometimes that, that can come off as harsh and, and some people will dislike you personally because of it. Um, you know, I'm self-aware. I, I realize that part of it has to do with my own style of, of writing and rhetoric, which I think can be helpful in some ways, but can also alienate people and others. Kind of think like whatever the universe gives you, it takes at the same time. There's always a balance. Mm-hmm. Um, but I also do think that the left has changed from 
what it was 15 years ago, um, in part because there's new issues and different issues, but also because I think that some of the values have changed. I mean, one of the things that always attracted me about the left was the fact that free speech did come out of a left-wing 20th century political movement. You know, the ACLU lawyers who defended Nazis did so in the name of Jewish leftism. Most of the First Amendment cases defending the rights not just of communists, but white supremacists to speak freely without punishment were written by left-wing or liberal judges on the Supreme Court. The, the free speech movement began in Berkeley. But I also just kind of identified with the left because it was the anti-authoritarian movement. It was where transgression happened. You know, I remember like, you know, when I came of age as a 21-year-old, a gay kid, you know, the kind of enforcers of conventional morality were Pat Robertson and Jerry Falwell and the moral majority and the Reagan movement. And so it was the left cheering Sinead O'Connor when she ripped up a picture of the Pope on Saturday Night Live or arguing for liberation in people's private lives. And that's just where I like my tendency naturally is. And so I do think the left has become increasingly more repressive on questions of speech, but even like adult consensual behavior in a way that I find pernicious. And, and ultimately what I view myself as more than anything is someone who just tries to not attach myself to a dogma or a faction, which is easy to do, but, and sometimes profitable, but just some, an independent voice who just kind of pokes and prods at people's assumptions, because I think that's healthy to have people who do that in the society. And I see myself in part as having that role and, a lot of times that can alienate people or create a certain kind of resentment among whoever it is that you're aimed at at the moment. And so, you know, I, I for those kind of reasons, I don't really find it surprising. Um, although, as you say, given my actual work, you know, like if you look at what my journalism has been, taking on the NSA, you know, provoking and exposing corruption with the far right Bolsonaro government, over the last few years, a major part of my journalism has been exposing the evils of the industrial agriculture industry and factory farms in the name of animal rights, um, advocating for Palestinians and for Muslims generally, uh, opposing the war on terror and American imperialism. Yeah, it is a little surprising that I'm sometimes castigated as the enemy of leftism. Um, but, you know, people are very tribal. They see me going on Fox News. They see me periodically deviating from leftist dogma. And so just the nature of how our politics function, um, you can become an enemy of a faction with very slight deviations. Yeah, there is um, there there are a lot of unspoken norms and rules if you're part of the left. I mean, especially like I I'm some sort of Marxist. I'm not exactly sure which kind yet. You know, I haven't picked my sectarian group and been able to uh -huh. stick with it yet, <laughs> but but if you're within the Marxist online left, you pick up these norms and rules and they change over time, too. But one of them is that um, you don't associate with the right. You don't go on Tucker Carlson, for instance, or you, right. you and you don't platform people who are uh, beyond the pale. The problem is that who is beyond the pale shifts over time. Um, and um, I actually fundamentally disagree with that approach. For the most part, I certainly disagree with the idea that people who are not socialists should be judged by the standards of people who are committed to some sort of socialist project. Right. So, like, if I think that Tucker Carlson is a class enemy and I wouldn't want to reach out to his audience for some reason, which I actually think is a mistake. Well, that's my decision politically. That doesn't mean that you are for having been on his show or or that you're some sort of crypto anything because you never claim to be. A socialist, and I actually want to kind of underscore that point. Have you ever thought of yourself as a socialist or as a committed? Um, I'm going to say social. I could keep going back to that. You know, committed either anarchist or or uh, Marxist or or some other kind of uh, revolutionary type socialist. Or are you? Would you say trying to fix the system as it is now as best you can within those bounds? Yeah. So, you know, one of the, as you know, the thing that, that called my attention to your show and, and that caught us talking was uh, a recent uh, video that you did exploring the controversy that had been created by several comments of mine, uh, including the interview that I did with the Daily Caller, the mm -hmm. right-wing outlet founded by Tucker Carlson, in which I said 
that if you look at the word socialism, not kind of in the abstract academic sense, but in the way that it's effectively discussed in the United States, what it actually means in practice, you can group a lot of people into that category. And I named Tucker Carlson, I named the ver the branding version of Donald Trump in 2016 and Steve Bannon, um, because, you know, I think that um, one of the things that the left is failing to understand is, right, what, why right-wing populism is succeeding. You have to know your enemy or you can't defeat them. Mm -hmm. And so in France, for example, when Marine Le Pen ran against Macron and the socialists, she ran to the left of all of them, including the socialists, on questions like increasing pension benefits and retirement benefits. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like shut the border. Don't let any foreigners in. Mm -hmm. But for our workers, French workers, tax the rich and give them more benefits. And that was what Steve Bannon had Trump run on and wanted to do. Steve Bannon's vision of the Trump presidency was get into office, do a huge infrastructure plan of the kind Biden is now trying to do, raise taxes on the rich, create jobs for American workers, and elevate the standard of living that American workers enjoy by redistributing wealth and by creating government programs designed to improve their lives. Mm -hmm. So if you say to me, you know, one of the reasons why I generally try to avoid these terms is because th they mean so many different things to different people, including even left and right. You know, I, I rarely try and categorize myself left or right, socialism, communism, capitalism, because it can oftentimes shut people off from being open to your arguments by placing a label on it that they've been trained to dislike. So if you ask me, I don't, I don't and also I don't write a lot about economic, economic policy. It's never been one of my uh, focal points in my journalism or my writing, in part because I'm just not an expert in it. I'm not steeped in economic theory. I've never, you know, s studied economics. But if you ask yeah. me what my views are, you know, I've written this many times that I think one of the top two or three pathologies in American politics and in American culture is that the United States is no longer a democracy, but an oligarchy, namely that both parties are captive to the same corporatist interests and govern in their in their in their name, um, or at least, you know, subservient to them at the expense of everybody else, and that there needs to be not reformist or incrementalist changes to the two-party system, but radical ones. And I yeah. talked about the need to break up the duop duopoly because of that. So does that mean a socialist revolution or a communist revolution? I guess it depends on what words you mean. But mm -hmm. I don't think we have a free market capitalist society in the United States. I think we have crony capitalism. I think we have constant government intervention in the market, but not to benefit the poor or the workers, but to benefit the richest. And that I think needs to be destroyed from a revolutionary perspective. So, you know, again, I mean, the labels seem less important to me in part because they're so poorly defined. Socialism has a real meaning if you're in college and you're reading Marx. But if you listen to like AOC or Bernie Sanders or DSA, who all use socialism to describe their politics, and then you ask them what they mean by it, it sounds very incrementalist. They're not talking about revolutions. Right. They're talking about, as I said in that interview, sandpapering the rough edges off of neoliberalism, maybe a little more than that, maybe redistribution, which I'm on board with. And I also think there are people on the right on board with it. And that was, the, that was my purpose in those comments was to say to people both on the left and the right, you have more in common than you realize about these questions once you get rid of the labels. And the reason I think that's so important is because I'm tired of watching American politics stagnate. I actually want it to change for the better. That's the only way I think it makes sense to pay attention to it, if that's your role. Right. Well, see, I, having heard what you just said, I, I can see points of disagreement. And I think that those are they're important points of disagreement. The trouble that I have with the online left particularly is that rather than can, when they run up against somebody who has a different ideological perspective than their own, rather than explore the differences and the points of disagreement, that person becomes uh, uh, morally condemned. They get morally condemned or, you know, just they, they get this reaction because what it, what's easier than thinking through your disagreement is – having a visceral reaction that you're noticing that there's some sort of cognitive dissonance or disagreement and then, and responding, reacting in an emotional way, and especially on, on Twitter. But so, but okay. So I, I'm saying that really for my own audience. So 
um, what I would say is that uh, that my own development worked like this. I was um, an anarchist, kind of Chomsky following liberal. Most of my adult life, I wrote science fiction short stories and sold a novel and things like that. But around 2008, with the economic crisis, um, and I was working a regular job to support myself because the novels weren't doing that, um, I realized that I was feeling very precarious and that the leftists that I would normally turn to to help me understand the situation weren't helping. That the old line of like, oh, well, the problem is that everyone's too greedy and too much of a consumerist and and we need to uh, – the kind of ecological leftism – was out of step with the moment, I thought. So I started to a podcast and I started interviewing people, Marxist economists being some of them, and they were the ones that I found most convincing. So from my perspective, uh, you know, the, the changes that you see, let's say, in the term socialism are a product of the continued failure of the social struggle to take hold and a long process of kind of retreats. So like, for instance, the formation of the DSA itself in the eighties came after uh, a lot of unrest and, and really what a lot of people thought was revolutionary struggle in an old style Marxist sense, revolutionary struggle to get the workers together. When that fell apart, then uh, the DSA was formed and an admission that all that was left to do was to try to change the democratic party in order to open up a space for radical reforms so that a workers movement could be re, could be formed again it was not that this would be what made the society work was a better democratic party but it was in the with the aim of radical reforms so that you could then create a politics because it would have been so suppressed after the new left so you know from my perspective when you talk about socialism today and you point to someone like, um, uh, let's say, Steve Bannon, um, you're replacing not even old style, but this new social demo democracy, this progressive politics of redistribution for what was socialism. And I want to hold on to this idea that this, the socialism of college could be the socialism of the street again, and that, you know, the whole turn to make a – Marxism, uh, you know, associated with college, again, came out of the defeat of the new left in the 60s. And then the turn of all these radicals to do to go into the institutions again with the idea that you're going to change the culture and create a space for a working class radical movement to emerge. And instead, of course, it just got absorbed by the system. But in any case, like I see all these what, what you describe as kind of um, unchallengeable facts of reality I see as a result of this historical failure and that it would need to be, and it needs to be challenged. So, but, but I, so I just wanted to point that out there that, and also model for people watching that you can have ideological differences, but I'll let you respond to what I just said. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I, like one of the things that I appreciated so much about what you did in that video was that, you know, the way those comments and others I've made recently have been kind of spread and then discussed and, and castigated and vilified is, you know, little snippets get taken out, ones that fit nicely on Twitter, Twitter or in like a 20 minute YouTube segment where you don't have to like do much other than show, you know, the worst 20 seconds and make it look as bad as possible so that you generate rage and anger, which, of course, is what keeps people glued to their screen. That's, mm. you know. A, a kind of uh, intrinsic component of online and views end up getting distorted. And what I very much appreciated of what you did is you put my comments in context by showing not a 20 second clip, but a much longer clip and then explaining what, what it was I was saying and then proceeding to disagree with it so that I could actually recognize my own views that were being critiqued as opposed to views that were completely unrecognizable. I think, you know, one of the things that I, I've changed in how I look at things, um, I think it, a lot of it comes from the fact that I'm now married to a, a politician. Um, you know, my husband ran for the city council of Rio de Janeiro in 2016 and was elected. He then ran for Congress in 2018. And as I said, as a member of Congress um, with the actual socialist party, with actually the party that, used to be part of the workers party and then split off from the workers party in protest of what they viewed as the kind of neoliberalist neoliberal 
direction or compromises of the Workers' Party under Lula. So there, they were always kind of the oppositional left party. They become closer to PT now with Bolsonaro in office, but that's the nature of the party. And my husband as well, you know, he grew up um, in one of the worst slums, the favela, one of the worst favelas. In, in Rio de Janeiro, and he grew up as an orphan. His mother died when he was five. He never knew his father. He was raised by uh, an aunt in extreme poverty. So none of this is abstract to him. And, you know, one of the things that I've seen kind of, you know, seeing things from the inside, which is what you do when you're either doing that or married to someone who is, I see all the time, you know, he'll have like a proposal, like a bill that he wants to get passed to fund some program in the favela where he grew up or one like it. That will actually improve people's lives. But then he has to go to the parties that are in control of the floor of the Congress and say, and they'll say, we'll let your bill come to the floor for a vote and we'll even support it if you get your party to support our shitty, corrupt lobbyist payoff or, you know, this like regulatory change that our agribusiness donors want. And then you have a choice, right? Your choice is... I'm going to go denounce you and tell you to fuck yourself and be pure and principled. Mm -hmm. And then I'm not going to get funding for the people who I promised whose lives I would help when I ran for office who voted for me. Or you can say, you know what? I guess I have to make that compromise because I want to help these people's lives improve. That's the only way it matters what I'm doing. And then you risk the more you make those compromises becoming part of the system that you set out to destroy right that you you come you kind of become a cog in it and so you know as i said like i've been writing about politics for 15 years when i started i believe that the democratic party was like sincere about wanting to do stuff and they just didn't have the political courage and then ultimately i realized that was all bullshit that the reason they don't do it is because they don't believe in it and don't want to because they're serving a specific interest and so i have begun to kind of change my view on incrementalism, which is not that we should have as our goal reforming a shitty, fundamentally corrupt system, but that sometimes you kind of have to take the chips that are on the table. Otherwise, things just don't move. And so, you know, I'm well aware if you ask me, do I think Steve Bannon or Tucker Carlson is a Marxist or like a socialist in the traditional sense which is at the very least, like just want to take one example about international solidarity. Mm -hmm. And there's none of that in them, right? They're Mm -hmm. uber nationalists. Mm -hmm. I would, of course, say no. But, you know, again, what I'm trying to do is to get factions that have been convinced that they have nothing in common to realize that, in fact, they have things in common. There's an anti-establishment wing of both parties. There's an anti-tech and anti-oligarch wing of both parties. And there's even an anti-corporatist wing of both sides of the spectrum that I'm really interested in bridging into a coalition. The thing that struck me was when Governor Cuomo tried to give away billions of dollars in tax breaks and subsidies to Amazon to induce them to open a new headquarters in Queens. It was AOC who jumped up and said, this is corrupt and outrageous to give the richest man in the world tax breaks at the expense of the population. And the only person in media who defended her was Tucker Carlson on anti-corporatist grounds. That's the space I wanna work in. And sometimes it's thankless because it's, as I said, easier to just stick to your tribe and say, this is my team, never going over there. Mm -hmm. But, you know, being able to open those dialogues has enabled me to go on Fox and talk about the evils of the coup in Bolivia. And the interview I did with Eva Morales after the coup were to talk about, you know, Bolsonaro's links to paramilitary gangs 15 minutes before he made his first live appearance on Fox when he was getting ready to go visit President Trump. It, 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 it lets you be able to foster changes. And yes, it's true. Sometimes you have to abandon doctrine to do it. And that can make it seem like you're a sellout or you don't really believe in anything. But I think it's always the importance of finding that balance. You can go too far in playing the game as well. And then you do become a cog in that system. But that's always the balance I'm trying to navigate. See, I, I think that the problem on the left is not so much that um, they're too doctrinaire. Uh, but that the, the, there isn't enough clarity about uh, a common purpose of amongst, let's say, even the Marxist socialists for there to be strategic thinking. Like if you have a, an aim, a political project in mind that makes sense to you, um, and let's say that your aim is to uh, lift up uh, the general wage 
so that most people are are living comfortably. And that's your political project. Um, and, you know, you're then willing to make uh, alliances with people who have very different politics in other domains in the service of that one aim. You know, then that makes sense. But if you're a revolutionary socialist that you want to get to the radical, like to the root of society in order to change it, that doesn't mean you want to do it tomorrow. It doesn't mean that every decision you make will be the big decision that changes everything. It just means that's the aim, right? Then you have to like figure out what is the root of society? What 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 ultimately needs to be changed? Um, what are what is a radical reform as opposed to one that's that sends us back into just accepting the status quo? When do we make sacrifices? Who do we align with? And what are what are the trades off trade offs? But the problem is that we don't have on the American left anyway anything like a common understanding of what our true radical aims are instead what we have is an ascetic uh, a feeling of oh yeah marx was cool and i'll wear the che t-shirt and i will call myself a revolutionary because i don't i feel like i don't like the world as it is and and then i can point to lots of different if i'm trans and that can be a part of it if i'm gay that can be a part of it uh you know if you're a cis white guy like me none of that can be a part of it so you know you better not use that in your politics you go way astray but in any case um uh yeah it, it's uh it, it we don't have that project yet we've lost it we've lost the plot and if we shut down conversations if we stop people from talking ideologically about these things then we're never going to get it back you know that that's so that's I'm I'm really not telling you anything. You know, look, I mean, look, I, I like I, I told. No. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I mean, and let me just hasten to add because you know I I agree with that I I agree with that completely. Um, you know, I I in in this past election, for example, you know, every four years, you know, no, everyone ignores Noam Chomsky, except once every four years when you know two months or three months before the election, the general election. He does an interview and someone gets him to say that he thinks everybody should vote for the Democrat, the Democratic <laughs> candidate, because it's immoral not to. And then suddenly everybody cites Noam Chomsky for six weeks and then the election's over and people go back to ignoring everything he has to say. Mm -hmm. So in the last two elections, actually, but especially in this last one, I was asked a lot about Chomsky's view that you have the moral obligation to vote for Democrats every time as the lesser of two evils, based on his argument that even small differences translate into big benefits in people's lives. And it's immoral for you to minimize or ignore those in pursuit of some more aspirational goal. And I've often said exactly what you just said, which is, you know, if you keep thinking that way, you're going to forever remain captive to the two party system and you'll forever be a slave to neoliberalism because at what point do you ever say, you know, it's time to think bigger. Um, mm -hmm. And to have a midterm or long term political project rather than a, an immediate short term one. And that, you know, at some point it's going to be necessary to say, I'm willing to lose some in the short term for longer term gains, which is more or less what you just said. I've always believed in that. I think part of the reason why Bernie Sanders became probably the most successive, successful left wing political leader in the last four or five decades in 2016, the 2016 version of him was because he was so plain spoken about first principles. And I'm, you know, he wasn't advocating Marxism or socialism, but he got pretty close. And what was so notable about it was that so much, one of the reasons he did so well, so much better than anyone ever thought he would do against the Clinton machine, was because he had so many supporters who were disaffected Republicans or independents and rural voters, not you know, gentrified hip, hipsters in Queens and Brooklyn or DSA members only. That kind of talk attracted people who are typically thought of as being repelled by a more extreme left-wing rhetoric. That is something I think needs to be looked at. And then for me, the most successful left-wing politician in the democratic world in the last 40 to 50 years is Lula da Silva in Brazil, who, you know, grew up as... Uh, he was illiterate until he was 10. He was the seventh of eighth, eighth children. He was a labor leader. He lost a finger in a factory. He never speaks perfect Portuguese. He was looked down upon by the elite. And he was elected president of 
Brazil in 2002 in a country that, you know, traditionally has been extremely elitist, where the rich poor gap is so severe it makes the U.S. look egalitarian. Hmm. And he left office after two terms with an 87% approval rating. And on the one hand, he did make a lot of compromises. Like the rich did well under Lula's governance. He wasn't, you know, he didn't govern as a communist. Um, but millions of people were lifted out of poverty. And the, 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 the appeal of him politically was he just spoke with such conviction. There was no rhetorical nods to kind of the – you know, beauty of capitalism or anything like that. And it was powerful because he spoke from the gut, you know, so organically mm. and, and honestly. And I agree completely that the American left lacks that and needs that. One of the questions I, I want to talk about is uh, the trans issue and how you've been um, vilified for a few things you've said about the transgender issue. Um, I, uh, I've had uh, Jesse uh, Single on um, recently, and I, I've been deciding that I'm going to be willing to talk about trans issues um, where for a long, long time I was not because it was such a hot button issue. Um, and it, you, it was so easy to say or do the wrong thing because there's actually no consensus about trans issues, even in the transgender community online, like on Twitter. They're constantly at each other's throat. Um, but what made you decide to step into that uh, fray, and um, how do you feel about uh, the way you've handled yourself in that, uh, you know, battle? Given the state of trans issues in America right now, I, I was sort of shamed recently on one of my uh, on uh, on my Patreon. One of the patrons said, "Hey, you know, in Arkansas they have." just made it illegal for kids to get treatment for gender dysphoria. How do you feel about, you know, what you've been doing recently talking to Jesse single? And my response was, I, I feel like I should have done this sooner. Maybe if we've been talking about things, there would be more people willing to stand up against what's happening in Arkansas rather than people feeling so completely alienated from that struggle. But what was your thinking behind um, entering into that? You know, it's really bizarre. I have to say, like, I mean, I don't really fully understand what has happened because for a long time, I didn't talk about trans issues at all or even or write about them or any of that. Not for the reason you said, which I want to get back to, because I think it's incredibly important what you said about why you haven't and didn't until recently. Mm -hmm. It was because for me, it was such an easy debate. It was like, of course, I'm in favor of the full agenda of trans equality. I mean, I grew up as a gay kid in Reagan's America. I had to live outside my own country for, you know, a decade because there was a law called the Defense of Marriage Act enacted by Democrats and Republicans in the mid-1990s that barred the federal government from giving the same immigration rights to my husband as he would have received had he been my foreign national wife. And so the cause seemed identical to the one that I had spent my entire adult life advocating for, which is the right of individuals to live their lives as they define it and for the government and for society to be organized to foster maximum self-actualization. It didn't seem to be a particularly controversial question for me. And it still doesn't like this law in Arkansas that you mentioned is repulsive. And I denounced it this week because what that law says is that it is a felony, a felony for any doctor, any medical profession to provide any kind of trans positive or trans affirming medical puberty blockers, hormones, or gender reassignment surgery for anyone under the age of 19, even if their doctors, their mental health professionals, and their parents and themselves all agree that they have gender dysphoria and their mental and physical health would be improved through this medical treatment. What right is there for the government to intervene and override their judgments? And I particularly found it hypocritical that conservatives were supporting this, given that they've been waving the flag of parental rights for decades, right? You don't tell us if we can homeschool. We have the absolute right to homeschool. We can send our kids to religious school. We don't have to send our kids to public school. That's our decision to make. 
for our own kids. This seems so obviously violative of that alleged principle. And so if you put me on the spectrum of where people in the world and people in the United States fall in terms of their support for trans equality, and without question in the 95th percentile and probably even higher, and yet there seems to be a consensus on the online left that I am transphobic, that I hate trans people, that I'm an enemy of the trans movement. And if you ask me how that could have happened, I will tell you, I don't know. Um, I think the first time I ever wrote about trans issues was when about three months ago, Amazon banned or removed from its website, a book by the author, Abigail Schreier, who had written a book questioning whether uh, girls were being influenced by the culture to become trans or to, to conclude that they're trans, even though they're not really. In other words, whether they're being misdiagnosed. Certainly a legitimate question to ask. Um, I don't think that's, you know, a crisis, but I'm interested in the data. I think people should be freely able to discuss that. And not only was the book banned, but a lawyer from the ACLU, one of the most important organizations in my life, like the formative organization of my life, a group with which I've worked extensively, that shaped my views on so many issues. A lawyer, a trans lawyer who I've worked with before he represented Chelsea Manning came out and applauded the censorship of that book by Amazon. So I wrote about that from a free speech perspective, not a trans perspective, just saying, I think this book ought to be permitted to be read and bought. And I think it's dangerous to try and construct the debate. And not only do I think it's dangerous, I think it's counterproductive. Getting back to that point that you just made, you know, I think the reason why gay men and lesbians succeeded in our crusade to convince the public that they should accept our relationships and our identity and give us full legal rights is because we constantly wanted there to be a debate. We sought out the opportunity. I know personally, whenever I hear someone say, have misconceptions about what it means to be gay or to be in a same-sex relationship, I would run over to that because that in there lay the, the opportunity to change minds. Mm-hmm. And it was through engagement of that debate that I think gay men and lesbians prevailed. And so if you create a climate where people like yourself just said, I'm going to run away from that as much as possible, because I know that if I even step my foot in there, it can be dangerous. I think that is an incredibly counterproductive climate to create just from for the sake of, hey, for the sorry, for the movement, for the movement itself. Um, And that was part of what I was doing. And then, you know, I do think, you know, what had happened was there was a kind of controversy um, recently where a writer advocated that Substack should, the, the, the online platform where I write, where Jesse writes, where Andrew Sullivan and Matt Taibbi and Katie Herzog and others write, should start censoring writers on the grounds that we're anti-trans. And this writer was a longtime feminist, Um who, you know, did a lot of activism. His name is Jude Doyle, Jude Sadie Doyle, um, always under the name of Sadie Doyle. I'm a woman. I'm a feminist for 10 years. I think a few months ago, he announced he was trans. And now he's writing an article under the headline, you know, Queer Rebellion, saying he, this person who has lived his whole life in a heterosexual relationship with a husband, with a child, as a woman, as a straight, white, cis woman, is now the person who's the oppressed person under the queer flag and calling me and Andrew Sullivan and Katie Herzog, who have lived our entire lives, you know, suffering discrimination and bigotry because we've lived our entire lives as part of this movement, we're the oppressors. And so I did a 90 minute segment with with Katie, who's a, a lesbian writer about how the movement has kind of changed and that also got taken out of context, and, and suddenly I'm now an enemy of the trans movement, as is Jesse and as is Katie, even though all of us fully support 100% legal equality and cultural acceptance for trans people. Mm-hmm. I think the only kind of questions that people have that I share are two areas, which is one, how young is it? Is there is there an age at which it's too young to let kids start um, being self-declared or diagnosed as gender dysphoric and treating them as the sex other than the one in which they were born. Mm -hmm. And then also, is there now enough of a scientific consensus and a protocol that makes it fair for people who are born biologically male and who go through puberty as men and then who transition into women to compete fairly with sports in sporting competitions with uh, cis women? That's Mm -hmm. it. Every other 
part of the trans movement I'm fully supportive of. And so if I'm an enemy of the trans movement, I don't know who their allies are. But I think that what you said is so important because that is what has happened is they've almost driven people away. If you're going to propose major changes to the society, like redefining marriage to no longer mean between a man and a woman, but now to mean two, between two women and two men, or to say that people who are born as biological men can and should live their lives as women or vice versa, huge social changes, you have to give people the space to ask questions and to have their doubts addressed and their fears, you know, resolved because that's how you make progress. And if you create this climate where people believe that their heads are going to be chopped off and their lives are going to be ruined because their reputations are going to be wrecked. If they do one wrong foot, take one wrong step on this incredibly complicated and radical movement, I think they're doing themselves a huge disservice and are, are engendering a lot of hostility where they probably would have found support. And it makes me wonder whether not ordinary trans people, but the most vocal activists or professional activists, like what used to be LGBT, gay, lesbian and gay groups, like the human rights, uh, like HRC and, 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 and GLAAD, who are now very focused on trans, whether they actually want to win. Because winning means it's time to pack up and go home. You don't have any more kind of money to raise based on legal challenges. And it feels like at least some of them want to turn you into their enemy, even if you come saying, I'm not your enemy, I'm your ally. Um, and so I think there's a lot of what's going on. Yeah, I um, was reminded, the last thing you said reminded me of being a very young man when I was 20. Uh, and working in like a public interest research group called the Osberg, Oregon State Public Interest Research Group. And it dawned on me over the months that I was working there that the uh, PERG didn't, there were certain issues that it wasn't trying to win. It was simply trying to perpetually put forward a lobbying effort and raise funds around. And, you know, it's just clear as day. This is like just, the PERG is just an extension, a small subset of the Democratic Party. And it was a fundraising Op operation for the Democratic Party, and I just realized, you know, in my early twenties, that oh, this isn't about saving the environment. This is about getting Democrats elected over and over and over again. Um, the other thing that uh, I want to say is about say um, no, sorry, Jude Sadie Doyle. I've known about her for since my first book came out, um, and around the time that Julian Assange was. Uh, charge uh for with rape allegations um and you know it became clear right away that those were politically motivated and that um the women themselves didn't really uh, make accusations of rape for you know that there were that it was a complicated story and that the u.s government was really looking to extradite him um and and charge him with something altogether different um and of course today we can see clearly what what, what it was about um, that, you know, it's, that's not a question, but, um, now Jude Sadie Doyle took the opposite perspective and I, this was my first Twitter encounter really was when I disagreed with her about this on Twitter and, and where it went. And, um, and here's what I have to say about her. You may think that you have suffered more oppression and more discrimination as a gay man than, than she has. But what you don't take into account is that she had to live her whole life as Jude Sadie Doyle. And it, being Jude Sadie Doyle is not easy. You suffer a lot of oppression and discrimination. Um, you know, and that's all I'll say about that. <laughs> so. Yeah, you know, um, yeah, Jude, Jude, Jude Sadie Doyle is, I believe, a unstable pathological liar. The things that he, and by the way, just by the way, on two occasions, just in your answer, you very inadvertently and with complete good faith referred to Jude Sadie Doyle as she, which is a pronoun that you rejects. Oh, I'm and sorry. I could see people saying, no, no, don't, don't apologize. <laughs> me, but I could see you saying, I could see people saying like, oh, look, you know, during this conversation, there was misgendering. That's the kind of thing like this very innocent, you know, well, inadvertent. I, was, I was going after him. Like I was not trying to be nice to right, but dude. not not by misgendering, not by right, misgendering right. by offering a critique. Anyway, mm, I yeah. think that's a lot of what happens. But yeah, I mean, I think you know, um, yeah. And the other thing is, yeah, I, think, I, think I, I knew of, of, of I knew of Jude Doyle as Sadie Doyle for over a decade, forever, right? forever. Right? Their their their, uh, their argument was, I'm a woman, I'm a feminist, my cause right. is. 
Hillary Clinton and, 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 you know, like liberal white feminism. And as a woman, I've, I under, I, I've suffered misogyny and sexism. And that's why this is my cause. That's what all you heard. And now it's suddenly on a dime. It's no, I'm actually LGBT. And not only am I LGBT, but I'm the one who gets to take this LGBT flag that you've been living under for your whole life and beat you with it. It seems to me that, uh, the climate that we're living in right now, it, and it has been for the last four years, but it seems particularly right now because of, of the combination of having gone through the Trump administration, the Trump years, and then living under lockdown for a year and facing a big international restructuring and, and resetting as the uh, 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 bankers are talking about, um, that we are the, the the woke language and the the censorship of online platforms is all taking place in a context which is political in ways that people aren't quite understanding that it's not about the issues it appears to be about but it really does strike me now as a move towards authoritarianism um by the state not by the, by big capital and 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 the state and not and uh, not some small NGO or not Jude Sadie Doyle, you know, it that th these things are being used uh, opportunistically. Um, and uh, I wonder, uh, I mean, I, well, I guess what I all I can say is we have to recognize that and that people like you are actually faster at recognizing that than people who are committed socialist leftists who have been, I think, infected by the Democratic Party for decades now and don't understand where their interests are and where the Democratic Party's interests yeah, are. Yeah, I, I think I think it's such an important point, and I'm glad that we're going to end with it because it, it is it's such an important point. I think to talk about that, you have to talk about it both as an, a weapon mm -hmm. and a religion. So let me just quickly tell you what I mean by that. So I think the first time this I, I really got clarity on what was going on was in 2015 – the British spy agency, the GCHQ, which is the British counterpart of the NSA, and actually more vicious and more severe than what the NSA does whenever the NSA would want to do something and concluded they couldn't because of legal or ethical constraints, they would farm it out to the British. That is a very pernicious agency. And that was part of our Snowden reporting. And in 2015, they announced LGBT Day. Because the famous British code breaker during World War II, Alan Turing, uh, was himself gay, obviously in the closet, persecuted severely at the time because of it. And they decided they were going to celebrate him. And their headquarters is this like really creepy looking UFO shape. It's like this circular building with a big space in the middle. And they literally drowned the building, just bathed it in the colors of the rainbow flag. Obviously, trying to put this pretty liberal left face on this militaristic institution. And you see this over and over now where every major authoritarian institution of militarism and corporatism now drapes themselves in identity politics and woke ideology, which is why every major corporation, <clears throat> you know, puts Black Lives Matters banners on their um, Instagram page, why, you know, the CIA celebrates Women's Day and Trans Day. It's all about deceiving you into believing that these institutions are kind and gentle and loving and noble and fair because they're weaponizing identity politics to distract you from the reality of what neoliberalism and imperialism are. It's an incredibly cynical branding weapon that so many people on the left are falling for. And it's not just them, but also the Democratic Party, right? So, you know, you get Janet Yellen, a longtime servant of austerity in banks, and you celebrate the fact that she's the first female Treasury Secretary or Kamala Harris, who devoted her life to locking people up for nonviolent offenses as a cop and a prosecutor. And you tout the fact that she's the first person of color, which she is, to be a vice president. And suddenly you're supposed to feel good about these people and forget about the reality of what they're defending and what their ideology and function in the world is. Obama was a good example of that as well. So that's the one way it's a weapon. The way that it's become a religion is that even before the pandemic, if you look at all the 
uh, indicia of mental health in the West, every siren was flashing red. You know, increasing levels of mental health pathology, depression, suicide, anxiety disorders, addiction, everyone going way up. Because modern society is not providing people with the things that we as human beings need. There's, you know, the West is largely secular, which means we don't have religion and not just religion in terms of explaining the universe to us, but even the community aspect of it of going to church or synagogue or mosque every day, every week, or, you know, having a pastor, having a, a rabbi or, or, or an imam. Um, so that's been taken away from us because of the growth of secularism, which I think is a good thing, but nothing has replaced it. On top of that, you know, when people don't live in small communities, but live in huge cities, everyone's atomized, you know, and, and, and kind of working and living alone. I lived in New York for 15 years. I don't think I spoke once to my neighbors because people would think you were weird if you walked out of your apartment and they did to the elevator to go to work and you said hello or talked. You just didn't. Everyone, you know, just kind of kept to themselves. So when you disconnect everybody from any kind of sense of community or common purpose or religious spirituality, and then on top of that, have a pandemic, which requires everybody to be locked down even further, where we're all just interacting with one another as pixelated images on a screen. I think that people's mental health has ex been exacerbated severely, naturally. And there's an interesting his history of pandemics giving rise to like apocalyptic cults and new religions, because people search for meaning when they feel threatened and they're disconnected. So I think that the George Floyd killing and the protest movement it spawned, and the kind of new way of talking and speaking and thinking around it became a kind of religion and is becoming still a state religion, a secular religion. And like any religion, it tolerates no heresy. It tolerates no questioning. It's a totalitarian way of understanding and explaining the world. Mm -hmm. And in everything I just said, what's missing is any kind of emphasis on class, any class struggle, or any understanding of the distribution of power in the world through imperialism, through militarism. And that's why corporations and centers of power love this so much because it's so easy for them to co-opt and to unite people around in a way that, for, that strengthens their power rather than undermines or subverts it. If you enjoyed this conversation, please do consider supporting us on Patreon. Our patrons help to make sure that Sublation Media can continue to provide interviews, videos, books, and articles that are critical of the left from the left. If you are tired of remaining stuck within bourgeois ideologies and politics, help us sublate them both. <laughs>